Welcome to Mobile Impact 401, Mobile Tech for Offices and People. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I am the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. I've been with the organization for about six years, and prior to that spent about a decade working at small nonprofits where I was often the accidental techie trying to make technology decisions for my organization with very little tech expertise. Also joining us today is Matt Bauer, the CEO and co-founder of Better World Wireless and also Better World Telecom, where he you know, has a great breadth of expertise as a webinar, I'm sorry, as a mobile expert in this sector, and he'll be sharing his tips on how to cut the cord and bring mobile uh, friendliness to your office. And we'll also be joined by Brent Muckridge, the CEO of Upsource Mobile Services, who will be bringing his expertise to the, the event today with tips on how to welcome mobile in your office, how to develop and devise, bring your own device strategies, and how just to make it easier for you to have a remote workplace if that's something that helps support your staff. You'll also see in the chat Dulcie Bauer who is with TechSoup, and she'll be on the back end helping to answer your questions and flag them for follow-up when we need to. A quick look at today's agenda. I'll do an introduction to TechSoup if you're not already familiar with us, and we'll spend some time talking about the Mobile Impact webinar series, taking a few polls of you, our audience, so that you can help guide us in your level of expertise. And then we'll talk about device strategies, what, it, what kinds of devices are out there, and what the trends are looking toward, how to develop a bring your own device strategy, looking at what a mobile office entails, how to cut the wire, and then we'll spend just a couple of minutes toward the end talking about the Better World Wireless program which is available through TechSoup's donation programs. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So who is TechSoup? We are a 501c3 nonprofit working towards the day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization on the planet has the access and knowledge to, to technology resources to meet their mission. We've been around since 1987 distributing technology donations to more than 60 countries around the world. We are constantly expanding the different offerings in our product catalog to now include things like consulting services, Windows 8.1, and QuickBooks 2014, among many other things. And you can find all of these at TechSoup.org. Looking at the Mobile Impact series, if this is the first webinar that you've attended in this series, and you may not be aware that we've attended or we've presented three others so far, and this is the fourth in this series, where you know, we as a collection of organizations here on the screen, PayPal, Network for Good, Better World Wireless, and TechSoup Global, recognize that social sector organizations are needing more expertise in mobile and how to embrace it because it is happening so quickly all around us and being embraced in office places. We want to make sure that you can stay up to speed with all those changes and have the best, uh, best information to make decisions that work well for your organizations. So these organizations have come together to sponsor this four-part series. Additionally, we have been working on a lot of content and articles and blog posts that talk about the different ways that you can work with mobile at your organization. We have also had a variety of partners who have helped spread the word and share more information about this too. So we want to thank them quickly before we get started. Social Media for Nonprofits, Volunteer Match, Mobile Beacon, N10, the Case Foundation, Foundation Center, and GuideStar have all partnered with us on this project to uh, get the most information out in a free capacity to you. Uh, and so we'll be doing more on this topic moving forward as well. But we'll make sure to point you to those first three webinars in case you're interested in learning about the other topics we've covered on mobile so far. To get us started with today's topic, we want to have you take a poll, actually two of them. So take a moment to click on your screen on any of these that apply to your organization. So does your organization already have a mobile usage policy or some standards or processes in place to allow your staff to use their mobile phones? Do you allow your staff to connect via mobile device to your network, to your VPN? Do you invite staff to use their own tablets or bring their own devices, use their own laptops or phablets or phones? Do you encourage remote or off-site work in your organization? 
Do you have a, vo a VoIP, Voice over IP, or wireless phone system already in place? Have you gotten rid of your plain old telephone system, your landlines, and converted to that? Do you currently pay or offer stipends for staff mobile devices? So do you have tablets or phones that are purchased for your staff with organizational funds? Have you adopted a unified communications plan? And if there's something else, feel free to chat to us in the window because I see some people have commented other. But let us know what that other means so that we can do our best to speak to the needs that you are expressing to us in these polls and hopefully speak at the expertise level that is most useful for you, our participants today. I'm going to give a few more seconds so everybody has a chance because I know this uh, multiple choice where you can select multiple answers can take a moment. So I'm going to give 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And it looks at like about 66% already allow staff to connect using their mobile devices. And about 45% encourage or at least allow uh, remote and off-site work. 42% pay or allow some stipend for staff mobile devices. 36% invite staff to use their own tablets. That's great. And around 33% have a VoIP system, phone system already. Um, so that's helpful for us to get a good idea of what you're already allowing. And just looking at some of the comments, we have a comment from Brian saying, they don't have a policy, but they have specific staff members who are set up for remote access. So no connection is allowed with mobile phones, but certain staff members are allowed to connect wirelessly or remotely. Some people say they're an all-volunteer organization, which is fine. A lot of volunteer organizations uh, definitely rely on staff to bring their own devices because they don't have the funds to necessarily purchase them. Um, Kim comments that they have laptops and cell phones only because they're a small nonprofit. Jason comments they staff pay for their own devices, but we partially reimburse a portion of their personal monthly cell phone bill. And Annette comments that they're in hurricane country and they stay away from VoIP because it's unreliable and a disaster. So that's an interesting point to make. We'll definitely have an opportunity to talk a bit more about that later on. I want one more poll before I hand over to our expert presenters today. So does your staff work entirely on-site or do you allow remote or off-site access? And I know we asked a variety or version of this in that first question, but we really want to get an idea of where people are at when it comes to cutting the cord. Maybe it's only select staff like what Brian mentioned. Um, or maybe it's all staff, but it's not necessarily with a policy in place. So take a moment and let's get an idea of where you're at on cutting the cord. Anthony comments that they're afraid of information being stolen or shared by the wrong hands. That's a good point as well. Um, Kofi mentions that certain staff members are allowed remote connection, but not all. So this is great. It looks like there's a good mix. And I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results, but feel free to keep clicking on your screen if it's available to you. Most of you, 70% almost, say mostly on-site with some, some off-site. So that's helpful to know where, where most of you are at. But a, a sizable chunk, 13%, say a large part of staff are remote, and another almost 9% say they don't have an office, so everyone's remote. So that's a sizable chunk of our audience today that already has either partially cut the cord or allows for people to work off-site. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome our presenters to the line today to help use that information to tailor their presentation a bit to your needs. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be first joined by Matt Bauer from Better World Wireless. Thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time out today to share your expertise. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Becky, and welcome everybody. Thanks for being online. Uh, we're, we're coming to you live from the Mobility in Action Summit in uh, beautiful Kansas City, Missouri at Sprint's uh, global headquarters. So we've got mobile mobile and mobility on our minds, and I uh, feel like we're doing a radio talk show here. So a <laughs> so, uh, couple of the main points that we want to uh, get out in the beginning are, uh, you know, kind of the nature in the, the first slide that you'll see 
here online uh, really touches on that in that uh, you know the, the, the term office and, and work, uh, where it's happening, where it's transpiring, and everybody is the percentages show on this. Uh, on the polls we've done, is, is a lot of people are understanding this. And then also, uh, you know, technology has, has increased and outpaced uh, what is actually being utilized by people on an average basis uh, to a degree where many offices, many office environments are, you know, potentially a decade or more behind in the, uh, the technology that's available to folks. Now, this is getting short up, but it's, there's a real opportunity here to really take inventory of how you work, the trends that are going on, that you know, remote work and the term the office is really uh, headed for obsolescence. This is going to mean a thousand different things to a thousand different people. Uh, and, and some other technology things around the corner. Landlines are uh, being phased out in some degree in the technology around them. Uh, mobile's really taking hold. So uh, especially in the millennials, you know, the, the funny picture here of the to toothbrush or or, or smartphone, which one's more important? And actually, they like their smartphones better. Uh, so going to the next slide, we're focused on uh, take-home value, giving you uh, some, some real uh, tangible things you can take away from this. And there's going to be a lot of other resources that are coming forth as well. But uh, you know, mainly beginning on device strategies, trends, what's going on in the device, device world, bring your own device. BYOD is another uh, big trend that's happened almost overnight, relatively speaking. Uh, setting up a mobile office, even though some folks out there might be in a, mo you know, in, a, in a remote office or some are working remotely, there might not be a strategy in place. There might not be sort of a cohesive thing holding it all together. So we'll talk to that. And uh, looking at those strategies around cutting the wire and, and taking a plan and, and executing that. So that's really the, the focus on and the take-home value that we want to get uh, from, this, from this, uh, this exercise. So I'll start by stepping back just a, a little bit. When we are uh, in the process of, of launching with, with TechSoup on our uh, mobile, mobile products uh, over the past year, uh, Nielsen Cares was very gracious to work with TechSoup and, and really measure what's out there. So uh, take, a, take a, uh, the pulse of the community, of the TechSoup community in particular, and what do people have? What are they using? And so we came back with uh, a, a poll was on a very wide uh, group within TechSoup, and we had over 300 respondents who all filled out a detailed analysis. And you can see here from the results that uh, uh, over 60% are using mobile to help deliver on their mission, and that uh, over half are paying some form of a stipend or uh, paying for the whole mobile service for, for some or all of their employees. Uh, not a lot, you know, two-thirds haven't changed in five years, their provider. So they're kind of staying home, staying in one place, and those that did change said it was mainly for price. So there's a real opportunity here, and, and Brent will talk about that and some of the other things that are happening, is why we see that sort of thawing uh, in, that, in that piece. The uh, uh, who, who are we using? Uh, Verizon and AT&T were over 80%. And uh, postpaid and a lot of people, uh, three-fourths use bring your own device to some degree. So uh, with that, on the device front, I'll turn it over to Brent, uh, and I'll talk for a few slides on devices and BYOD. Great. And, and thank you, everybody, for your comments in the chat window and particularly answering the polls to give us a sense of what you're facing as your organizations today, and we'll, we'll kind of address some of that now. Um, bring your own device strategies, is, as Matt has said, it's kind of, kind of started overnight for most companies. Uh, and surprisingly, 55% uh, or more companies in the U.S. today do not have a bring your own device strategy, thereby either just ignoring it or um, flatly saying no to it. Um, and what is, what's interesting is the, the push is becoming much more driven by the employee for being able to either use multiple devices that they're comfortable with or being able to use the platform which they're most comfortable with doing their daily work. Um, some of the studies are showing that productivity goes up quite a bit where people who are using what they know and can access much better uh, get much more productive productivity out of their day. Uh, we're seeing that 
you know, a really good strategies are thinking beyond email. They're not just thinking about have accessing your emails on your phone, but really addressing the issue of accessing files and information. And many of you have commented that you're dealing with highly confidential or sensitive information. Um, and that's what these strategies really need to address. How do you go in and put in the right security protocols, um, giving the right password or levels of access? And so those kind of strategies really do help the organization to kind of develop and really focus in and address those concerns, uh, and thereby allowing you then to create much more of a, a, a mobile or remote working office. When we think about the strategies, there are there are definitely some areas to uh, mistakes and stuff to avoid. And I think one thing that people don't uh, really address very well is thinking about the apps that they're allowing on those devices to interconnect with the company information. There are a lot of great apps out there, and there are a lot that have been developed for the market that have been very successful, and particularly for the nonprofit communities. Um, but at the same time, there are some out there that aren't very good or very secure. And so one of the big mistakes most make in their, their bringing your own device strategies is they, they don't talk about or address what are some of those apps that are, are acceptable to download and to use in conjunction with or integrating into your company's information. Um, a lot of the other components that people forget about is, is just making sure that people are taking care on their device to have passwords or updating their passwords to the um, servers or their files and information that your, your employees are accessing. Those are really some of the, the, the big you know, missteps which leads to people having the concern that your data is not secure or it's not being you know, properly handled. And I think when you develop a strategy and you lay out those kind of rules, you can help um, particularly some of your board concerns get you know, overcome that by addressing um, that you do have a security policy in place. You know, the mobile device, and, and, and we're being very specific, is saying device instead of calling phone, tablet, tablet, you know, laptop. They're all becoming very remote and, and easy to access. Um, but the big thing is all of them need access to be able to access your information or be able to access the cloud. Uh, and data in general. You know, we were finding that right now that 54% 54 for, for of all devices by the end of next year will be smartphones. Um, one in three people have a tablet. 56% um, of the people in the U.S. today have more than one device. So we're seeing a strong push uh, in these mobile devices. People are, are being able to access them. Uh, and we're seeing that um, Within the smartphone area, people are getting, they're becoming much more uh, a very personal assistant, if you will, and something that they reach for. Um, you know, most people within 15 minutes of waking up reach for their smartphone first to check their email than they do anything else in their day. So we're finding that uh, with the trends within the mobile area, and particularly when you pair it with a bring your own uh, device strategy, uh, companies and organizations are seeing big savings, not only just in the equipment of having to supply it, but also just in the annual cost of maintaining devices and also maintaining the, the connectivity. They're saving between $300 to $1,300, depending on how comprehensive uh, your bring your own device strategy is or if it's paired with a remote office strategy. So last but a few more points on some of the device trends we're seeing. The um, handset and, and overall device costs are dropping. Um, we're seeing that, that even Apple, who has maintained a very high margin and a high price point, is starting to decline and, and bring down their price points. Uh, device subsidies by the carriers are going away. Uh, people are moving into device financing options, which is allowing it to spread over time. Um, and we're seeing much bigger moves and advancements in uh, mobile data speeds. So we're seeing data speeds going from 10 megabit down to upwards of 50 to 60 megabit down with the advanced LTE programs that almost every carrier now has launched in some major markets in, uh, around the country. And I think that's going to continue to, to drive a lot more innovation in this area uh, where it allows you to be able to really truly cut the cord and, and not see a difference. Uh, in the last couple of days here, we, we've been in a, a Sprint Spark network area and been able to see really amazing speeds where I wouldn't know if I was on a fixed line in, inside my office or on a remote device. And lastly, we're seeing the big trend in wearables and what that's you know, bringing to the market. On the end of last year, 2, 2 million um, device, wearable devices were uh, sold. 
and we're seeing that to continue. It's projected to grow by the next by five uh, times over the next two years. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Matt, and let's start talking a little bit more about the mobile office. Okay, so one of the main themes we're talking about is cutting the wire, and what does that mean? I mean, it does. It's one of these terms that you know means a few different things to different people, and what we mean by that here is do you know a lot of organizations have redundant uh, infrastructures in place. They have an office or some offices, and you have some of the old technology or wireline technology. It could be VoIP, it could be POTS, it could be DSL, things like that in place. And then you also have mobile devices, and you have mobile uh, tablets, phones, etc. And so that that percentage is definitely growing over time. The percentage of offices that have uh, you know what I'll call landlines uh, or older technology like that, etc., is elusive, the, the, the number on that, but at least from the home standpoint, about 50% of the homes have, have gone mobile only. So we'll just sort of use that uh, stat for the moment and say, okay, well, uh, let's say half the, half the offices out there, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit, still have uh, you know, at least some form of, of landline, and that number is probably higher than that. Uh, so there's a lot of cost implications, and there's a lot of productivity implications, and so on. But just touching on, on some of the pieces as to why, you know, before getting to the cost element, which is kind of an obvious and easier uh, one to tackle, um, why have a wire? Why have a line in your office? Why keep one or many? Uh, well, one is, 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 was brought up just earlier, you know, is a you know, sort of lifeline or disaster planning uh, if there is a hurricane or storm, or it could be something, you know, even simpler than that, that causes an outage in your area, uh, that old technology lifeline phone lines, they, they, they work on their own power, and uh, it's good to have you know, some of that in the, in the background. Uh, and, and then also as a redundant uh, type of feed. So it could be redundancy, it could be lifeline, but there still is a requirement for that, and that's something that should definitely factor into the strategy. And also you might be in a cell area that doesn't have very good coverage. That's going to change significantly over the coming couple of years. Uh, the areas that don't have good coverage or aren't on 4G or 4G LTE are going to start getting covered, and those networks are all rolling out very quickly. Uh, Verizon and AT&T are ahead. Sprint's catching up fast, and T-Mobile as well. So that, that's, that's happening. And the difference between 4G is huge. You know, it really is three to four. It doesn't sound like much, but it's a, <laughs> it's a quantum leap in terms of speed. Uh, and coverage, uh, everything gets better under that. So, you know, addressing very quickly then the cost savings is something to keep in mind as we go forward is that when we look at our strategy and we look at our plan here in a few minutes, that, you know, really dialing in on do I need both infrastructures, do I need one or the other, and assessing how that's serving your mission, asser assessing how that's serving your community, and there's probably uh, if you have an office environment and people working remotely and constituency that you connect with, there's probably some savings to be had there, and not just the, 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 the communication line savings, but also other soft uh, costs that you're incurring. So looking at specifically some of the technology around uh, mobile or cloud communications, a lot of uh, 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 virtual, we'll call use some of the industry terms, they're, they're uh, more engineering type than, than uh, you know, friendly terms, but virtual PBX uh, is one. Unified communications, you know, what do these things mean and what do they, you know, it's really what they're doing is removing location from the equation and lifting your phone numbers and centralizing them into a place that's in uh, a hardened data center away from where you are and probably redundantly located across different parts of the geography of the country or the world. So it does remove that disaster. You know, again, that question that came up earlier, uh, if, you're, uh, if your power is down in your building and, or in your suite or in your office and you have a traditional phone system, well, people can't call you. And so when you go to something that is a virtual uh, number or unified communications, then it removes that from the equation. And those instances of that have... Uh, enormous resources around them and many, many people 
on that same system. So uh, it, it's a level of quality that, that you wouldn't get from your own office system that is really just a bunch of redundant systems around the country. It's not very efficient. And uh, so these technologies have matured a ton in the last five to ten years. Uh, I would say especially in the last five years where they now compete with uh, the traditional landlines in terms of voice quality and, uh, and availability in, in most cases. So, uh, however, a lot of them were designed more for the office environment, the desk phone, and also the, the desk phone in the home. You have companies like Vonage that were out there you know, early on selling this into homes, and then other companies selling uh, different, a myriad of companies that sell them into office systems. Uh, but they weren't designed for the mobile first and then for uh, the desk phone. They were designed to, to cater to the desk phone and then fall out to your other numbers that you might have. Well, that's changing, and there are solutions now that are designed with mobile first in mind, and then they back down to other numbers, if you wish, so that they work on the mobile platform. There are more apps that you download as opposed to desk phones and such that you have to install and the software that goes along with that. Um, so that's, that's uh, sort of the high level of that. And then the, the features that you get from these kinds of environments, you know, if you think about it, it's centralizing your voicemail, centralizing your uh, management of your call tree, of how people get to you, how you get to people and how they get to you, whether it's internal, your own staff, uh, your constituents, your community, whatever it may be, this is uh, an opportunity to really look at that whole ecosystem and these types of systems have that ability to really make that communication more efficient. So it's easier for people to get a hold of you, easier for you to get a hold of them. You don't have to have multiple systems to maintain, multiple uh, infrastructures, data technologies, all that different stuff. So. This is a real opportunity to get a lot of features that would be on a very expensive system in uh, a more, more uh, cloud-based communication system, and now those are available on the uh, mobile office environment. So going to uh, a plan. So the plan is an opportunity for us to kind of discuss how would we, how would we do this? You know, how would we look at our situation and, you know, Folks get really hung up on the technology piece where it's actually just as much around the people, the management, the culture of the organization, uh, whether it's a small nonprofit, large nonprofit, medium sized, you know, there's, there's challenges built into each one and how everybody works together. Is, and, you know, how, do we, how do we put communications to work for you and your mission as opposed to uh, the other way around? Oh, it's just, you know, this is a, a football that I, you know, I got passed and I've got to deal with the phone systems or whatever. Now with the technology, it's really come to a point where, okay, how do we become better, faster, and deliver on our mission by assessing what we have, creating a plan, and then implementing it, creating training around it, and keeping it updated. So, so let's dive into that and, and look at the first piece. And uh, uh, Brent and I will, will sort of share the mic here and go back and forth on these next, next few slides. But I'll, I'll lead it off with, uh, you know, by, by having that assessment, looking at who your stakeholders are, how you communicate with them, how they communicate with you. Are you doing the most that you could? Is it, is it easy? Is it easy to maintain? Uh, are the systems around that cohesive? Do you have to leak, check voicemails in five different places? and you have five different systems that you do. Are your faxes still coming into a paper machine? Ugh, no need. None of this stuff. And a lot of organizations are still doing that. You know? So it's, it's really stepping back and an opportunity to look not only at technology, but also you know, the people, the interaction of how they're interacting and how they're employing that. Right, and I, and I would add to that, Matt, is that you know, when you look at the, the mobile office plan and you're making your assessment, and the big issue is around your, your, what you have for equipment and what you have for the technology that's helping you, you know, complete your mission. What, are you able to service your needs and, and complete your missions more efficiently? Uh, and can you drive out some of your administration costs out of your bottom line so that you can put more towards your missions and, and meeting your goals? And I think that's where um, some of the questions have, have been going through the chat around, 
you know, the benefits of moving to the cloud or moving to something newer, uh, there's a lot more aspects to it, not just being able to say, I've got the latest and greatest of Microsoft Office, but is that new version bringing a new collaboration tool that makes it more efficient for us to work with a bigger group of volunteers today than we've, we've been able to in the past? And I think that's one of the assessment plans that has to be done, and you know, each, each group needs to look at is, how can we be, how can we make ourselves more efficient, how can we get more reach, and then how can we reduce our administration costs so that we can further our own mission and reach our goals. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. It's, it's not that one line item that you pay every month that is, you know, telecom or phone or internet or what have you. It's all the other pieces that impact that. And, you know, one, one call that came from a donor that uh, nobody was able to pick up and they, and they didn't get back to him for two days because the voicemail was trapped somewhere, you know, whereas you can put a system in place that, hey, if these 10 people ever call, ring everybody in the organization until somebody picks up. You know, something like that is a really kind of funny example, but it is totally available with these types of solutions that are out there. Oh, let's have a volunteer hotline. Okay, what would that look like? So all our volunteers can call in and get updated info they can leave messages. Uh, all those messages will get emailed to the right people. Um, you know, any sort of disaster preparedness or things around that, or in school communities or libraries. You know, being able to work, you know, with parents and the children in a different way by putting that. Uh, so these are all, you know, a few examples of of stepping back and saying, what are those things that we're doing as an organization, and how could we make them better? And it's really fun because it's a way to take inventory of of the mission and what are those things that we could be doing better if we had the technology to help us and oh by the way the cost of this technology and TechSoup has a lot of it on its on its platform is come way 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 down and so what used to cost tens of thousands now probably costs hundreds of dollars a month and uh, and it's available to a much wider group of people so moving on to creating a plan um, there's a lot of options out there, and so you know, instead of us droning on here for uh, what what could be hours, you know, going through all the different solutions, you know, there's some there's some popular uh, tools out there. Again, TechSoup has has a number of options uh, available on its site, but you don't have to search far to find out which companies are providing these services and get ratings on them and and what they're doing. But essentially, you know. If you can catch, and you don't have to have the latest one. That's the great thing is it's, it doesn't have to be the latest device. It doesn't have to be the latest service provider that's providing the services. I mean, if you catch up within two or three years, the curve on this stuff's kind of flattening out a bit, like Brent had talked about, so that if, if you've gotten everything up to where you're at least close to being current, you're really taking advantage of that technology. So you're not getting on the, the, the bleeding edge of, of the technology, and there's no need to do that. Um, I'd say also on, on uh, becoming less dependent on location. You know, that's a whole, uh, a whole philosophy, a whole mindset, right? So this, this idea that we're still kind of reporting to the factory after, you know, after uh, all this time. We come in every day to a place. A lot of people still come into a place. You know, do they need to? What, what productivity are we losing by doing that? Uh, in looking at our plan, so it's how we how we manage how our how our people work, and do we need to all be coming in here? You know, do we all need to be here every day, and and how do we enable that? And what are the communications platforms that we put in to to enable that? And make it one system, make it one seamless system that we all have a part of and we all can maintain instead of having one that's in the office, one that's on my handset, one that's over here. You know, so that we all, especially in a multi-office environment, multi-location, some people working from home, I mean, this is like a survival tactic. You really have to have something like this to get the most of that so that you're not dropping calls, you're not losing potential donors, you're not uh, serving the constituency as well as you could. Yeah, and I think that's the, the, the main piece is when you build out this plan, you build in your bring your own device strategy, your security strategy, so that you... Your, your employees understand exactly when and when not to use it or how to use um, their devices or you know, appropriate places to access information. Um, you know, not using a hotspot in the coffee shop to look at sensitive files, but rather wait to your home or you have your own dedicated secure 
mobile Wi-Fi box that you can use um, to secure that data. Those are all the things that really formulate in this plan that really help then make the mobile office a real tangible thing, but then everybody understands, like they would in brick and mortar, they know their boundaries. By putting the plan together, you give them those boundaries virtually, but allow them to understand how to operate. And, and really, the, you know, the genie's out of the bottle here. It's, it's uh, you know, people are working remote. They're checking their email in different places, regardless of what's going on. Uh, you know, so it's really how do, we, how do we make that the most efficient we can, put some rules in place, give everybody the right expectations so they know what they're, uh, what's expected of them, and, and really uh, take an opportunity to lay that down. And, and it, it, it have, could have significant impact on a lot of organizations. Um, so now we've got our plan, and we want to go out and implement it. Typically, to do you know, an all or none, sort of we call it a hot cut, where you uh, uh, go from what was there to the new uh, thing, <laughs> whatever that looks like, overnight, uh, typically is, is, is rife with uh, the issues and uh, could be very expensive. And so you don't want that first experience to be a disaster in and of itself. So better to kind of feather or layer these, uh, these technologies in. So say you're switching from a, uh, you know, we're a 15-person nonprofit. We have five people that work remotely sometimes. We have a, a PBX or key system in the office that's 130 years old, and it still works, so we still use it. We have five POTS lines, two DSL lines, and we all have cell phones that we got from uh, different providers. <laughs> you know, you look at that and you're like, oh, you know, how do we get, a, you know, how do we communicate at all? So you're going to change that. Okay, we're going to get a unified communication solu solution where all the numbers are going to be in the cloud. They'll be able to reach anybody anywhere. They'll be able to uh, maybe leave a lifeline in place uh, if we if we need to, and so on. So that over you know a few instances is a little bit easier to deal with. Um, I don't know. Any other comments on that, Brent? No, I think that you know Matt's right. You, when you do these kind of implementation, it's, it's also really key is you know make the migration smooth for your organization. Don't try to go and you know force it down to people, but really take the time to train them. Make sure they understand your plans and your policies. Uh, make sure they understand you know the do's and don'ts, and and also provide them with some you know information so they can be a little bit more independent, a little more quote unquote self care themselves. So that you know the new change of technology or uh, the migration to the mobile or cloud services uh, doesn't become a big shock, and so it helps that organization move smoothly with it. Because the faster people get comfortable with it, the faster the adoption rate and, and the buy-in you will get in your organization. Absolutely. So the last piece, and uh, and we're running running up against uh, a little bit of time here. We want to probably end it in the next few minutes so we can get questions and so on. Um, so keeping the plan updated, this is probably one of the most difficult pieces. Uh, you know, I've, I've always loved organizations that, you know, take somebody who's in a totally different discipline and says, oh, well, you enjoy, you know, tech, why don't you uh, do this as part of your job? And it gives them something challenging that's outside their sphere, or you have an IT resource on hand, or you outsource to somebody. So there's all kinds of different solutions. But somebody should have a, uh, a, a task of keeping this plan updated, of keeping current with the technologies, making sure you're getting all the features out of these systems. A lot of these systems have a million features, and most uh, nonprofits use five or ten of them, let's say. And so what are all the features? Making sure we're taking advantage of that, you know, and maybe that's rolling out over time. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, staying ahead of that curve and creating more efficiency and productivity and, you know, bottom line, delivery on the mission uh, as, as much as you can. So, uh, you know, just kind of re rewinding and reviewing that, uh, the four pieces, you know, assessing, creating the plan, implementation and training, and updating that plan. And using this as an exercise to make communications fun. You know, we're in the industry. We love this. This is our lives. You know, we, you know, not everybody gets up every day and is like, woohoo, let's go get mobile telecom, you know. But, but, it, it can be a way now to really look at how the organization fits together, and it can be one of those things that helps bind the organization. It makes it easier for people to come in, for people to go out, and to manage all of your stakeholders as well. So it's, it's, 
if you change how you look at it, it's going to change for you. And so that's the thing I guess we would I would leave with you last. Yeah. No, I got it. <clears throat> so we've deployed uh, at Better World Wireless some of these uh, pieces in the TechSoup environment, and uh, you know we're just ecstatic at our, our launch over the last few months uh, in the community. So we have some of these mobile services available that uh, a number of, of TechSoup members have taken advantage of, our Just Plan, and the discount that's exclusive to TechSoup members, and there's donated Vipers. There's about 400 of those left on the, on the platform. And then coming soon, we'll be uh, uh, deploying the mobile office apps as well for uh, for for uh, smartphones and other devices, mainly smartphones, and that can serve as a unified communication. So that's that's coming around the bend. Yeah, I think I think Robin or one of them in the chat asked if the VPBX was available today, and that's one of the products Better World will be launching uh, in in the coming term um, that would help address that and be able to provide that service out there to you. So I think we hand it back to you, Becky, at this point. Thank you both for that. Um, really quickly before we move into the Q&A, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the Better World Wireless program that you mentioned, Matt. Um, let me see if I can get this to pull up here. So for those of you who are interested, this is our little mini commercial here that we do. Since these are free webinars, we make sure that if we have a program that applies to this that we have an opportunity to promote it a little bit. Um, and then we'll launch into your questions. So we do, as Matt mentioned, uh, have this program with Better World Wireless where they provide access to discounted mobile services and devices. So if you're interested in that, you can find that on our website at TechSoup.org slash BetterWorld-Wireless. You can see the address up there. And we'll be sure to share a link to that program so that you can learn about the discounted rates and those mobile devices that Matt mentioned. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with Q&A. And feel free to keep your questions coming in throughout this. We will uh, make all of these slides and resources that we discuss available later. Um, but in the meantime, we have some questions. So a couple of the things that were raised in that comment period earlier when we were polling people, you know, questions about you know, for example, Annette had raised that they live in hurricane country and they stay away from VoIP because it's unreliable and a disaster. And you know, I know you mentioned that somebody could have a a lifeline, landline to keep keep things connected. Is that what you would recommend for people who might be in a disaster prone neck of the woods if they wanted to move to VoIP? What's the best way for them to do that? Well. For, for just for clarity, um, now it's about 74% of all international traffic uh, that terminates from any part of the country is all VoIP. So you already are by and large using VoIP. Um, you may not be using a Internet call service, um, but you, the VoIP is really prevalent and, and being used by the services. But certainly, I mean, any of these plans, and even, even a mobile office plan has to have a backup. There has to be an ability for you to be able to still work and be productive in um, you know, areas that are either hurricane prone or uh, as we've seen with some of the disasters in Hurricane Alley in the last couple of years, you know, having the ability to either be able to be on the wireless and be able to use that because that service can be brought up faster than repairing the fixed lines or the converse, the fixed lines in these areas have been buried underground and therefore are impacted by these natural disasters. You kind of have to have a full plan, uh, a fallback plan, but uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing much more, and, and particularly a lot of my work uh, in, in countries abroad in some of these natural disaster areas, uh, mobile it tends to be the most reliable. It's the one that can be brought up the fastest, um, and it is one area where you know, the, the carriers literally drive in a truck of towers and bring up service very fast before first responders to be able to communicate. They're very heavily dependent on the wireless communications. And so that is typically the service that is brought up first. Great, and, thank and you. The, and oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, and just to add on to that, and and you know, moving your number so the unified communications and virtual PBX type services give you that ability also to remove your number from that. So if people need to get a hold of you, you know, you could have multiple numbers in your profile uh, on on your uh, on your instance of whatever system that you have in the cloud that they can then still get a hold of you. So those numbers are still ringing, and your if your landline is up, if your mobile phone is up they'll get to you or they'll leave a voicemail and you'll be able to get that as soon as you can. 
So that could apply to a number of scenarios, whether you lose power because uh, a backhoe hits a power line somewhere nearby your office, or a natural disaster, or uh, <laughs> you know the the system didn't you know stop working in the office or something. It could be a number of things. So uh, just a good good philosophy to add on to the planning for this. That's great. And we do, um, you know, at TechSoup we've written about disaster planning. And in general, no matter what your system is, we recommend the two by two by two. So two copies in two different locations where two different people have access to it. And that doesn't matter what the service is or what the technology is, um, especially for any mission critical data or, or technologies that you need to have access to. Um, similar to that, we had a, a concern raised by uh, participant Brian who mentioned you know, that they deal with a lot of highly confidential information and that their board is really worried about security and hasn't been really comfortable using the cloud or remote access or VPN, letting people connect remotely. How do you recommend that people – well, one, is there, are these systems secure? And two, do you have recommendations for helping uh, board members or senior staff sort of uh, get over the hump of fear, <laughs> get over that that um, concern. Well, I think I think there's there's twofold. I mean, one, I, everybody and every company has you know a certain level of highly sensitive, confidential information that they're they're happy to protect. And I think uh, you know what what most don't do is put in that right you know security uh, program that says this information is accessed by these people or uh, we secure it this way with these passwords. Um, the cloud services, are they, are they secure? Are they protected? Yes. And, and we, you see lots of companies, lots of major Fortune 500 companies are running on them. Um, a lot of the nonprofit organizations globally that have operations and missions in, in developing countries are heavily dependent on these cloud services uh, for transferring that secure data they need to between their, their offices. Um, you know, I, for getting a board comfortable with it, I think one of the things that most people forget is your office today with only having information that's stored or on a computer in your organization's office is probably the most insecure place to have it. Because what typically happens, how many people have seen someone copy that file on the thumb drive so they could take it home, work it on their home computer over the weekend, and come back for the Monday morning's meeting and you know, bring back yet another thumb drive? Once that file was transferred to that thumb drive, it's now you know, completely insecure. Anybody could get it. It could be lost, stolen. Um, and then that information has been transferred yet to another machine to be worked on. So I think people forget, and, and particularly when they're trying to be so sensitive, is the natural behaviors in your organization today by making it so tight and so hard to access, you almost force people to do some workarounds that really make your organization insecure rather than helping them get, you know, get a, a very structured way that they could do that and bring their information. Um, you know, securely, securely access the information, retain the information, and, and most importantly, make sure that the organization has it so that if, the, if an employee leaves for you know, a negative reason or, or you're forced to remove somebody from your organization, you still have that, that information. It's not been lost. It's not been damaged. Great. And we, you know, we have a couple of people who commented while you were chatting too and just mentioning things like you know, HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Information and Portability Accountability something Act <laughs> that, um, that many organizations, if you deal with client data that's sensitive, you have to follow these different standards. And, and another one, FERPA, if you work in education with students that you have to be um, keeping track of where that data and that sensitive client information or student information lives. And that you know, these systems are built much more secure, securely these days than what, like you mentioned Brent, that much more securely than what the servers on your site usually are kept up to speed with. So I would agree with that point that it, particularly for smaller organizations, the cloud is probably many times more secure than, um, than what you're doing on site unless you have a really dedicated IT staff that's working to keep that updated and maintained and encrypted and all of those things all the time. Um, you know, we don't have a server farm in most smaller organizations. So 
That's a great point. Um, let's see. We also have a comment I think that's useful from Dendra who makes the comment that with a virtual board that she can track exactly who has looked, looked at what. So when she lets people access things virtually, she can see who's been in and what's been looked at and what's been opened. And you know, so that, that I think is pretty helpful in order to keep those legal requirements for, for things like HIPAA or FERPA in line. Yeah, and most in most systems, you know, if you are setting them up as an organization, uh, the, the person who's the administrator for it, it usually has the audit rights to see who's been into the information, when was the last time it was checked, you know, who who did it last, who saved on it last, uh, and some of them keep multiple versions, so they can't necessarily write over the last you know stored version. Uh, and so those are right. things that you, you know, as you think about it, there are some some really great benefits, but. It's all about building up that policy and, and finding out the best way that it works for your organization. And do you have um, recommendations, either of you, Matt or Brent, or examples of you know, what a policy would look like um, that we could point people to? Maybe we can share in the follow-up resources if you have any um, for a bring your own device policy or for allowing people to connect with their mobile devices um, to your network. Any recommendations for policies on that? Yeah, I think I think what we what we'd like to do, uh, and again, instead of going into a lot of those details and references on the on the webinar, if we could follow up, maybe the the follow up from this is a little a uh, few hours delayed over the typical, uh, so that we can pull together some some you know more deep data for folks to use uh, as they start looking at their strategies and developing their strategies. And have you know references and information in there that they can they can pull from readily, and we can send that to everybody who's on the on the call or put it up on you know TechSoup as well. That would be great, yeah. And I think you know we typically send out the follow up email later the same day, and I think we'll hold off until tomorrow. So you'll get that follow up email with the presentation and the links and everything sometime tomorrow um, instead. We also have uh, some questions. Uh, so for Anthony, he asks, can I give employees access to only portions of files without opening up the whole network to them? So if people are connecting remotely? Yes, you definitely can. And I think in, in even from um, you know, a basic Citrix you know, remote access server um, client that you can put onto your server, or if you're using a cloud-based one, you can give permissions. Um, even Dropbox allows you to give permissions um, by file by folder or by sections. Um, so the, what's the nice part is that most of these uh, cloud-based systems have become very, you know, very end-user friendly. So um, I always jokingly say if my mother can do it and, and she's in her mid-70s now um, and gets it and can figure it out intuitively, most people can. And, it, and it's a great thing because it really relieves, you know, A, the organization from having to have a dedicated resource. And B, it also makes people more willing to use it when they feel comfortable being able to do it themselves. And, and that, just, just to add one more thing onto that, so in looking at the whole picture, so we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of questions around files and storage and security. Uh, there's, you know, the, uh, the shared information of the organization, so obviously that needs to be part of the plan. But then the communications, you know, pieces as well, and those can be handled the same way so that there's an administrator for that system, and that administrator has the ability to minimize or maximize the features, the types of things that people in the organization can see. And if you did both of these on a premise-based solution, first, you know, it, it's, it's going to be uh, less, uh, less secure and more susceptible to issues than if it was, uh, you know, a cloud-based system that's going to have more features it's going to have more uh, availability, and it will uh, have a much more strict, you know, somebody like Dropbox getting hacked versus somebody's 10-person office, you know, the firewall for Dropbox is a mile high, you know, it's about two feet high for a small office because you just can't apply the resources and the same staffing and the same checks and balances that organizations put into place. Uh, and this stuff's grown up very, very quickly to where it's definitely uh, a great solution for everybody. That's great to know. Um, we had a couple of other questions before we wrap up. Uh, so Dendra asked, you know, are we 
talking a little bit and what could the implications be around the FCC's proposal to allow the two-tiered speed access? And so this is looking at Internet providers um, and their ability or inability to um, tier how we allow access and speed to, to the users who are subscribing. So that would allow Verizon, for example, to have a faster speed and a slower speed that they meter out depending on what you subscribe to, for example. Um, what impact could that have on nonprofits who are moving more to the cloud and, and moving more mobile? And should they be concerned about that? Uh, yes, they should be concerned about that. Um, in, in a minute or two, I don't know that I can cover 100 years of, of history and why it's important. Um, but I'll very quickly just kind of round it that all major communications, whether it's the phone, uh, TV, radio, newspaper, media, you know, have, have all faced the same sort of consolidation uh, and segmentation that is going on in these, in these proceedings. And we're, we're not political uh, and we're not taking sides in this, but what I would say is there, there has uh, been a ton of blogging and tweeting that TechSoup has been doing, the Better World Wireless, and many other folks. The, uh, the, the public comments, what I would do is, is definitely file a comment uh, with the FCC, and that's a very, uh, I think it's FCC.gov slash comments or comment. Um, I think they've had a record number of comments uh, for, on this issue uh, over any other issue that they've ever had. So the public's woken up to it. Uh, it's very important because what it does is potentially create slower lanes in the Internet for those who aren't going to pay. And so uh, right now there's one lane and everybody's driving very hastily and, and funnily through that, you know, funneling through that, that, that lane. Uh, this, would, this would open up the door for that extra lane to be put in place. So uh, it's something that every consumer, every person, not just nonprofits, not for-profits, it's something we all should participate in and uh, really welcome you to, to uh, become as informed, everybody on this call to be as informed as you can because it's truly one of those things that touches everybody in America. Well, and that is a good way for us to wrap up today's session. Thank you both so much for sharing this great information with us. Uh, you can continue the conversation at our community forums. We have a mobile and wireless community forum where you can continue to ask questions and find answers and share your expertise. We would also invite you to join us for upcoming webinars, which it was mentioned in the chat window, but I'll mention it again here that we are starting a series on mobile specifically targeting libraries. So if you are joining us today from a library and want to know more about welcoming mobile at your library and involving your programming and how to work with the communities of patrons that are coming to you, then definitely check out that series that's coming up. We chatted the link out, but we also have a couple of the upcoming ones highlighted here on this slide. We also have a webinar next week on writing earth-changing emails to attract more donors. And then we'll be talking about the sharing economy, companies like Airbnb and, and Uber and others, and what the nonprofit sector's role can be in those. Um, and then also we'll be looking at how to better captivate and engage your constituents with your website on July 31st. So please check out these and more at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. And you'll get a link uh, including all of these links and follow-up tomorrow. And lastly, I'd like to go ahead and thank uh, ReadyTalk, our webinar platform that we've been using today. They provide the use of this platform so we can provide these webinars on a weekly basis. I'd like to thank Dulcie for her help on the back end. And thank you again to Brent and Matt for your support and and participation today. Um, thank you so much everyone. Please take a moment when the window closes to complete the post-event survey so that we can continue to improve our webinar program. Thanks everyone. Have a terrific day.